So welcome everybody to the um, first TPAC keynote address. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Pete, Peter Sauer, or Pete as he's known to many of us. Uh, Pete is someone who's made outstanding contributions throughout his 45 plus career. But what I would say is uh, unique about Pete is he's not just a superstar in many aspects of our profession but he accomplishes it with great humility and selfless service. And this is not just to the high and mighty in the profession, but it's to everyone. And I've witnessed many interactions with Pete with undergrads and, and he is very, very helpful to them. He's clearly a legend in our industry. Um, if you know Pete, he likes to uh, make sure that we say where people are from. So Pete is from uh, Winona, Minnesota, and he's been married to Sylvia now for 50 plus years. Yep. I, I, I just saw that there. Uh, he got his degrees from University of Missouri at Rollo when it was still called that and Purdue. And then he took some time off to spend four years in the US Air Force. Uh, he spent his entire professional career at University of Illinois, where he rapidly rose to be a leader, not just on campus, but in the electric industry worldwide. Um, there's no way I could adequately list Pete's accomplishments and awards, but I did want to mention three of them. Um, first, in 1997, he received the IEEE PES Outstanding Power Engineering Educator Award. Uh, I've never met anyone as passionately committed to education as Pete. And on education, I would say one of his favorite sayings is students are not buckets to be filled, but candles to be lit. The second one is Pete was elected to the National Academy, U.S. National Academy of Engineering in 2003 uh, at a quite young age with a citation for technical contributions to the modeling simulation dynamic analysis of power systems and for leadership in power engineering education and research. Uh, since then, he's been very active in any activities. Uh, last, uh, most recently, just this last year, Pete received the IEEE PES Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, which I think of as our, our society's top honor, and it certainly could not have gone to anyone more deserving than Pete. Uh, I've had the honor to work with Pete as a colleague and mentor. Uh, for more than 25 years, and today he'll be providing us with some career advice and thoughts on the future of the power industry. So welcome to TPEC 2021, Pete. Thank you, Tom. And now, now you can share your screen. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I actually, you did it all, so I don't have to say anything. Yeah, that's right. I, well, I was just talking about you. Now you're going to tell them about how they can be successful like you. Okay, I will give it a whirl. But when you talk about people that are passionate, you got to look in the mirror and you'll see uh, where I get the ideas. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about power engineering, but mostly I'm going to give some humor to your, <laughs> to your conference. Uh, I have some things here that are uh, wild and crazy, and uh, maybe they'll be fun for all of you. Uh, I'll start with a quote or two. Uh, all, people always do that. There's an Albert Einstein quote, and this is a picture of Albert uh, with our son Daniel when I was there at NSF, and there's this statue of Albert Einstein right next to the National Academy of Science. And one of Albert's uh, Princeton favorite quotes is that only two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. And I don't mean that to be derogatory about humans, but that is what Albert Einstein thought. Another person that is on the same subject is Shmuel Oren. He's the PSERC site director at UC Berkeley who says that his goal in life is to stamp out ignorance. And my wife, Sylvia, that Tom was talking about 50 years or so, uh, one of her favorite things to say is, where are you when I need you, Shmuel? When she encounters some idiot on the highway or the road. 
a uh, family is such an important thing. And then when I look back at 74 years of my life, I was the fifth child out of six uh, to a Lutheran minister who was also a professor. And I had a mother who was very busy. I was born with a 100% coarctation of my aorta, which meant that it was completely closed. And I should have been a miscarriage. But my body built three collateral bypasses that allowed me to be born. All this was not known until I was 50 and I was getting short of breath easily. As it turns out, you also get a defective aortic valve with a coarctation and mine was leaking. The surgery took a while, but they put in a titanium valve and they put a Dacron hose around the blockage in 1997, about two months before our daughter's wedding. At the same time, Arnold Schwarzenegger had his aortic valve replaced. He had a fancy Ross procedure and it failed. So he had to have it done again. And my titanium valve, however, is guaranteed for life. So I shall not have to replace it I don't think. Growing up is an important part of life. Pete, I don't know if that's the sort of guarantee you want with an aortic valve. It's guaranteed <laughs> for your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but that's what they told me. And they'll, they'll be happy to replace it if it fails, if they can get to it in time. What I really liked was my summer job as an electrician's apprentice. I wired buildings and houses. And when I was graduating from high school, I told the guidance counselor that I wanted to be an electrician. He said, you can't do that. Your father is a professor. You should become an electrical engineer. So I said, okay, whatever, that's what I did. But I really enjoyed the practical aspects of fixing electricity and distribution and generators. I went to Missouri at Rolla, as Tom said, that was in 64 to 69, and that was right in the middle of the Vietnam War. And when I graduated, you couldn't really go on to grad school because the, the deferment from a draft stopped after a bachelor's degree. They would get you out of the grad school and, and get you in the army if you didn't do something. I enlisted in the Air Force, and fortunately, they needed electrical engineers, so they sent me to OTS down in San Antonio, Texas, Lackland Air Force Base. I remember the drive straight through from here to there. That was quite an, quite an experience. It was 90 days, uh, three months, uh, and it was roughly uh, April to June. Uh, following that, I had four years in Hampton, Virginia, where I designed airfield lighting, buildings, electrical distribution, and lots of backup generators all over the United States. I spent quite a few days at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas, and that was kind of fun. I used to lay on the runway, and I would, I would look straight up as the Thunderbirds were taking off in their F-4, F-4 Phantom Jets, uh, with the afterburners on. It was really cool. Uh, the service in the Air Force was wonderful. I learned so much about working with people, handling different situations, and of course, the National Electric Code, which is what you need if you're going to design stuff. After four years of that, I applied for grad school in ECE at Purdue using the GI Bill since they would pay me to go back to school. That was in 1973. That was the beginning of my career in power engineering. The guy that I worked for was Jerry Height. He was at Purdue then, he's at Arizona State now, but he was my MS and PhD advisor. He showed me how to write and how to teach. And these are two things that I have used almost every day of my life. And I, I owe so much to Jerry for what he's done for me. He accepted me as a student 
He helped me with my degrees, and then he nominated me for things. Kind of, he's another Tom. My first and only faculty job. I interviewed at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1977 and got an offer to start in August of that year. The person in charge of my interview and the job offer was Mac Van Valkenburg, a very famous ECE professor, and he was the first Granger professor of our department. I had numerous technical mentors, including Peter Kikotovich, P-E-T-A-R, P -E -T -A -R, who was the most influential of all of them. He's still going at uh, UC Santa Barbara, UC, UC California, and I owe so much to him as well. Just a little quick story about the University of Illinois. Uh, first of all, the S is silent in Illinois, unless you're asking the question, how many University of Illinois are there? I heard that from some alum. Everett Lab was where we worked from 77 to 2014. My office was right down the hall from John Bardeen. Those of you that know John Bardeen, a two-time Nobel laureate in physics, he didn't spend much time in my building, but his name was on the door and it was fun to walk by it. I don't know if that door got saved or not when they remodeled the building, but he was quite a guy and he spent most of his time in the physics department. On the right, we have the new building. We call it ECEB. And it's uh, recently been declared uh, one of those 100% uh, whatever it is with the, the energy. It's, uh, it produces with solar power and design almost energy free. Now, it uses some solar power from campus to add to that. But still, it's a nice building and is very energy efficient. The University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, they dropped the act. The faculty, staff, and students have grown up to have that farmland mentality. They are so kind and so nice. And when Tom talks about humility, he's the arch humility person that I know. And he's another product of that mentality in growing up in Wisconsin. Illinois is so flat that we joke and say you can almost see the St. Louis Arch from our roof. I stayed there for 42 years because of the people that were around me. It was such a pleasant to go to work there, so pleasant. We have a few jerks, but not nearly as many as some places that I have been. Professors do three things, supposedly research, teaching, and service. And what I quickly found out and tried to use as much as I could, that the fact that three of these three normal expectations, service is the most important. That's because service to IEEE, the university and society eventually lead to success in research, in papers and dollars. The reviewers of papers and proposals are your colleagues who get to know you through your service. It's awfully hard to get worldwide reputation and recognition from your technical work. If you don't show up at meetings and volunteer to serve on committees and task forces, you won't get known as quickly. So I'm here to promote the, it's the TPEC and PECI and all of these student run organizations. You should be volunteering to work there. And you sent us Megan Culler, who has a, an unbelievable service record at Texas A&M and now at Illinois. An interesting story from when I was an assistant professor. This is one that I use in one of my classes. George Swenson was the department head. 
And he came to me and he said, you're a power guy, right? I hesitantly said yes, not knowing exactly what he wanted. He said there was a problem with the backup generators at the very large array in Socorro, New Mexico. He was the radio astronomer that designed that lit large array. It was roughly a three directional setup of antennas, deep space antennas that went out 20 something miles each. And when the earth rotates, it was like a 30 mile diameter dish. The problem with the generators, there was only one and it worked to keep the computers and the antennas working during a power outage, which happened a lot in Socorro, New Mexico. But they wanted a second one for air conditioning. <laughs> I understand that too, it's pretty warm down in Socorro. When the second one was turned on, it would trip off immediately when it tried to synchronize with the first one. I studied this situation a long time, took two visits to Socorro, and did a detailed simulation of that configuration. We went there and sure enough, they would not run as a pair. I asked the operator to remove the cover from the power panel supplying the second generator. I wanted to see inside the panel. Having read up on voltage regulators and from my simulation, I knew that the voltage regulator of the second generator had to have a compensation circuit for it to work with the first generator to share the total reactive power. Those are the VARs and they're used in voltage regulation. That circuit required phase B current leaving the generator and of course the AC voltage for the voltage regulator. There's a little current transformer there on the right showing the round nature of it and you just fit it over the wire and it reads the current going through. Some of that uh, Faraday's Ampere's Law, something like that. When I checked the current transformer in that power panel on the phase B current, the polarity dot was not on the correct side of the coil. The coil was installed upside down. <laughs> we took it off, turned it over, and everything worked great. And I never had to worry about ten years after that. I like the power area because you can work anywhere you want. Any city in the United States or the world, you can wear anything you want. If you like to wear Chuck Taylor tennis shoes and blue jeans, you can do that. You can work outside, you can work inside. The options are complete. And where is the area going? Clearly renewables, electric vehicles, climate change, electricity markets, control systems, inverters, converters are all emerging areas that offer fruitful challenges and opportunities. There are such opportunities for additional contributions that whatever you choose as a career, it will, it will be important and it should be fun. It never gets old and everybody needs it. That's something that's important about technology. Here's a few things that I learned in 74 years, that it helps if you take the time to help other people. Becoming a professional engineer is valuable. I've had alumni email me and say, they're so glad that they took the fundamentals and engineering exam because they got their PE later, and then they were promoted because they were picked over people that even had master's degrees. Going to conferences helps you meet people. TPEC, PECI, these are the start of great things for your careers. Conferences help you meet people and they get to meet you. Join the IEEE. I did that when I was a student at Missouri Rolla and I got involved, not as much there, but after I 
got to Purdue in Illinois, I was active in the IEEE activities and conferences. Think of others when you do things. You want to treat them as you do, as you would like to be treated yourself. And so you try to make the world a better place. That's a quote from Tom Overby. Uh, I remember when he received an award for the outstanding young engineer. I think it was called the Walter Fee Award at the time. And he and Jerry Height were up there together accepting their awards. And this award gave you some time to talk. And Tom talked about his goal was to make the world a better place. And Jerry Height heard that. And he, Tom said he wanted to become a better, a better engineer. And Jerry Height was so impressed that he never uh, forgot about it. I also learned a few things about power flow and VARs, my two favorite things. And I learned about how to work with other people. There's always teamwork involved, and the more the merrier, and the more the easier. My greatest help in 74 years of all the things and people that have helped me in my career, the Granger family tops the list. And they have not just made my career possible, they've helped many others. William Wallace Granger was a 1919 grad from Illinois EE. He went into the business of automated distribution before Amazon. Of course, this was in 1920s. He sold motors and other hardware from hardware stores by mail order catalog. He still has a catalog today. The business was so successful that he made many dollars and created a family foundation. The company is still very successful and still making many dollars. And I'm a very pleased stockholder of both Amazon and Granger. His son, David, now continues the tradition of supporting academic programs in, in power. He supports quite a few across the country. He would probably support Texas A&M, but I don't think you need any support. You got all that oil down there. You're doing fine. The Granger Foundation has funded two chairs in the power area, two associate professor recognitions, the Granger Associates, a lecture series in power, which, is, which promotes seminars, Power Electronics and Machines Laboratory, the first one on our campus, one of the first few in the country back in the early 80s, a center for electromechanics and electric machines, that was a big one that Phil Krein, my colleague, uh, took over and still exists. And they are doing great things now, working on airplanes, electric airplanes, and other devices. They, they gave us money for an awards program for power students. I'm pleased to say that Megan Culler, who uh, came to us from you, uh, is going to receive a Granger Award for her master's degree in April. While it used to be uh, in live ceremony in the Granger Library, which they built for us, it's going to be virtual. So I'm trying to figure out how to do all this virtual stuff. And I'll try to copy TPEC anywhere I can. They also paid for a portion of our new building. And they have given a total of $300 million to our College of Engineering. And that has been unbelievable. Now, I want to emphasize the student issue. They, William Wallace Granger was a EE student. And he went on to become an entrepreneur. My greatest joy comes from the relationships that I have made with my students and colleagues. I recently found out that one of my very first graduate students has sold his company for over a billion dollars. And now he has contacted our ECE advancement office to talk about how he can fund assistance to our power area. The point is, the alumni are valuable. 
when I when I think of that three hundred million dollars, I just found out that Missouri at Rolla received a three hundred million dollar gift from a former engineering student, and these are clear motives for treating students with respect and making sure they're happy when they graduate. They can do wonderful things and they are so valuable that advancement should be a part of a faculty member's uh, job description. If you're in industry, I suppose it's not as, as uh, important, but economics is always there. I wanted to talk for a minute about common sense. When I was at NSF for a year, I was driving our 16-year-old daughter, Trina, around the DC area when we went by the Pentagon. I said, hey, Trina, do you know how many degrees in each corner of that Pentagon? She said without thinking too long, 360 divided by five. And I said, that would be about 70 something. Does that look like 70 something? She said, nope. Point is that while she did not know the geometry details at age 16, but at least she had the common sense to realize that it was not 360 divided by five. She ended up okay. She's now a full professor in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her name is Trina McMahon. I was quite surprised when she changed her name, but I figured, well, that's the way it goes. Uh, but uh, she did it. And she is quite a girl. And we are also proud of her. And she went to a good school. Someone asked her once why she became a professor. And she said, my dad's a professor. And he used to go into work at night and on the weekends. So she figured he loves his job so much, I wanna do that too. <laughs> so that was her answer. I had some fun facts just because it's Groundhog Day. Uh, the minimum numbers needed to uniquely solve a Sudoku is 17. If you only get 16 numbers, you can't do it uniquely. There's probably multiple solutions. The easy ones may have about 40 numbers. They're really easy. The hard ones only have about 20, and they are really hard. An approximate formula for computing the dew point. This is something that I came up with by just plotting the dew point on an Excel spreadsheet. And I realized that it was linear, almost except when you get in the extremes. The dew point is the temperature in Fahrenheit, minus 40 Fahrenheit, plus 40% of the humidity. And that's pretty close, within one or 2% if you're in the yucky times of summer, July and August. It, it's a pretty good estimator. Not that this is worth anything. I sent it to a weather person and they ignored it. <laughs> uh, Dave Takach was a planning engineer at Ameren. And he asked me for the basis for the following formula for estimating transmission line length in miles. 115 kV and above was his example. He said the length is approximately 408. 486 times the square root of x times b, where x and b are in per unit on a 100 MVA base. Here was my reply to Dave. I said, well, you start with something you know true. Transmission lines transmitted about the speed of light, which is one over the square root of LC, 186,000 miles per second where L and C are in appropriate units, Henry's per mile and so on. You convert the X and the B by dividing by 377M, where 377 is two pi 60, and the line is M miles long. One over the square root of XB equals 49, 494 over M, 
You just solve that for M. And you get 494 square root of X times B. The X and B are in ohms and moles or per unit, does not matter. Not sure why his was 486. Mine turned out to be 494. And I figured, oh, maybe that's because the actual speed of light, the actual speed of transmission is slightly less than the speed of light. Or maybe because it's the real value of X and B, do not use the simple ML and MC multiplied by length with our distributed parameter values. So I don't know if that's the way it originally was created, but it sounds correct to me. And I'll let you guys uh, and girls work on that. Let me know if you get a different explanation. Another interesting calculation that I have had fun teaching <clears throat> is the percent Z on a transformer nameplate. <clears throat> As you know, all transformers have a nameplate. Primary, secondary voltage, MVA, and percent Z. That percent Z tells you what happens if you have a 100% voltage short circuit. You'll get, if it's 5%, you'll get 20 times rated current. That's a pretty easy calculation. If it's 6%, you'll get 100 over 0 0.06 times rated current. I had a former student who used that while touring a substation with a vice president on a job visit, and he was hired on the spot. <laughs> it's a simple calculation. It doesn't take a long time to do, and yet it tells you what the transformer's series impedance is kind of like. You want the percent C to be a little bit high to limit the short circuit current, but you don't want it to be too high you don't want to limit it to zero because then you get too big a short circuit currents and that's hard to interrupt. An interesting quantity, percent Z. I'll end with another quote or two and I'll, I'll use one that was originally Oscar Wilde, which is to do all things in moderation, <laughs> even moderation. And that's from Oscar. And our Arnold Beckman, who created the Beckman Building, I see I have an extra N in his name. It should be Beckman, not Nan. He's an Illinois alumnus. The original, all things in moderation, goes back to uh, the Greek Aristotle. The most often quote that I used, and Tom Overby already told you about it, <laughs> was from Plutarch. He was a philosopher <laughs> and several other people since then, like Robert Schaefer, have really adopted it. Students are candles to be lighted, not bottles to be filled. It's true, and it works. And my last one, I think it is, well, sort of last, comes from MASH. When you encounter a jerk, there are jerks out there that make your life miserable. And Charles Emerson Winchester III, from the TV show MASH was a surgeon from Boston. It was David Allen Ogden Stiers, the, uh, the actor's real name. He went to Urbana High School, which is right behind our house right here. He went to that high school with Roger Ebert, the famous movie critic. What he says in one show when he encountered a jerk was, Will Rogers never met you, did he? Of course, you have to know. You have to know the famous Will Rogers quote uh, to get that one. Finally, my favorite challenge: name all the NCAA athletic teams whose names do not end in an S. My top answers are: Fighting Illini, Fighting Irish, the Stanford Cardinal, which is, which is, I don't think a bird. It's the color. Oh. NC State Wolfpack, Alabama Crimson Tide, <clears throat> the Syracuse Orange, another color or a fruit, the Marshall Thundering Herd, the Navy Midshipman, 
the Nevada wolf pack, you don't hear about them too much, and the Tulane green wave. There's probably more than 10, but they're kind of fun. And I always use it when I want to find out what people uh, do with sports. Here's my final advice. This is the Cowboys motto. <clears throat> if you've been from <clears throat> around here, <clears throat> there is a Decatur lawyer and this is his commercial with his, with his horse, Zero, uh, Zorro. If it's not yours, don't take it. <clears throat> if it's not true, don't say it. And if you owe it, pay it. I looked that up on the web and the cowboy motto on the web adds another one. If it's not right, don't do it. So these are common sense things, but they're what guide a good career. That's it, Tom. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And Pete, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I will just add one thing Pete Sauer is famous for is during the August 14, 2003 blackout, everybody in the, in the world wanted to know about VARS and Pete is the person that explained VARS in the New York Times. So he's, he's known for that. And I, yeah. I will say Pete on the Granger awardees, we did just hire one of those Granger awardees as a faculty member here at Texas A&M, and we're delighted to have Adam Birchfield joining us. So, wow, they're getting that's around. great. Yeah, Adam's a good guy. Yes, he is. Okay, anybody have any questions for Pete, Professor Sauer? I'm sure there's some out there. Let's see if there's just can people access like the chat and stuff. Yeah, so people can send a message. Um, us as the panelists should be able to see it. And so they can send it either using the Q&A button or the chat button. This is your chance to ask one of the true legends of our industry any question you want. Well, that brings up another quote. It's a semi-free country. You can say almost anything you want. <laughs> yeah, almost anything. Yeah. <clears throat> there are limits. So Ike here, one of one of the, the folks from Illinois said, uh, it, it just vanished here. Ike just said, what was the major challenge you encountered in your professional career? I would say the major challenge was <laughs> I can give it I can give you the first one, which was when I came here, all assistant professors, actually all professors, were required to bring in 25% of their salary in grants. Really? Wow. And they would have to buy out, which means they give the money back to the department. They wanted 50% but they would take 25. So when I finished my first year, I was looking at how am I gonna pay for my summer? Because you need money to pay for summer. I had an NSF grant that I got because of the student that is just sold his company for a billion dollars. That NSF grant was on stochastic power flow that I did for Jerry Height. And it was an NSF grant, and I got it. It was called a Research Initiation Award. So I was able to bring in money before my first summer, which paid for my summer salary and satisfied that challenge. And I have never had a problem since then with funds, thanks to the Granger family and NSF. So that's a big challenge for faculty. They have since changed the rule. You do not have to bring in half your salary anymore. Most of our faculty are on 100% state funding. You have to bring in money for the summer, but not for your academic year. But you're still allowed to buy out during the academic year if you want to, if you have extra research dollars and you don't need them or you want to have special activities that you want to do. 
So Pete, one of the one of the in the chat, one of the students said, "How do you handle rejections?" You know, I mean, of course, people deal deal with rejections on papers and and proposals and things like that. And then the other question that came in is, "What are the top three things you look for when recruiting new students?" So first on the rejections. Uh, what was the second one? Uh, top three things on recruiting new students. Oh. Well, dealing with rejection is a good question. It is very disappointing to be turned down. But then again, I know, I know reviewers that have told me that the first time they, re they review someone's paper and they're young, he turns them down because he <laughs> believes that that's, he thinks that's a good learning experience. So I have always tried to turn it into a learning experience based on that. I think it's a little rash to do that, but maybe it works, I don't know. Well, and I tell my students that you mentioned John Bardeen and his name was on the door when I came there in 91, although I think he had passed away by then. And even his papers got rejected after he had won all those Nobel prizes. Yeah, well, it, go, it goes back to some of the other quotes that I used, but reviewers of papers can be very tough and very demanding. And one other little subtle hint, if you want to get a paper accepted, you should use references of people that are going to review the paper yeah. and put the references in your paper. The reviewers like to see their names in the paper and they get credit for a citation. So, so oh, that's good advice. So what, what are some things you look for in recruiting new students? In my case, I, I read their personal statements and I want to know what they think about things. I want to hear their attitude and talk to them on the phone or at a seminar. I have heard some really good stuff and I've heard some really bad stuff. Okay. I don't pay much attention to GPA or GREs. The indicators of quality are not necessarily the grades or the scores. They are the kind of person you are that makes the quality. Just how much time do we have for questions? I see a whole bunch scrolling by here. Let's plan to wrap right. it up at 10.55. So we've got a little bit more time. So let me just see here. Uh, one student said, do you think the energy market will ever change? For example, do you think the electricity market will continue to be in a loud monopoly? And you know, one, one thing you should probably get across is the the, renewable energy and green energy and energy is hot right now but you know we all know in the 1980s it wasn't such a hot commodity and actually I I think that our profession owes you a big thanks because you did a lot to save power programs around the world uh, during that time when we were all closing down and, and Illinois came on on strong of course some of that was helped because of your relationship with the Grangers but that was a lot a lot Due to you too, so. Well, hey, Tom is <laughs> you're you're the one that kept it going because you came to Illinois, and yeah. without you, it would not have kept going. Uh -huh. And I guess the the issue of the markets. Uh, I was just looking, I'm writing a, a letter for a guy named Richard Tabors, T A B O R S. You might know him. He's from MIT, Boston, but he was a markets guy back in the day of Fred Schwebe in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. Fred Schwebe died at a very young age, but Richard Tabers has continued that markets research that started with Fred and the idea of demand response, time of day use, 
all of that stuff is going to become, I think, even more important with the, with the new emphasis on renewables and time of day and computers and the smart grid, all that is wrapping it up, but it's become probably the hottest area next to power electronics. Power electronics has blown out of the water everything. They are the ones that get the students. They are the ones that have the challenging problems now with their converters. And power electronics is probably our biggest area now. Uh, and markets would be right behind it. Uh, they're both big areas. Markets will, I don't think, ever go away. There are so many social issues. Uh, who's going to pay for charging stations for electric cars? That's a big one around here. You can't make it too expensive in the rate base because you have low-income people and you don't want to make them pay for the, the rich people that own the Lexuses. <laughs> so I think it's going to take a long time, but I just heard that I don't remember, it was GM. GM announced that they will not build a, an engine car by the year 2035, which is pretty close. Yeah. It'll be all electric. So those are big areas. They take slow change, but eventually they will overcome. And we probably will have all electric cars. I put solar panels on my roof. They're right now covered with snow. <laughs> so that's a bummer. But I got a $5,000 check in the mail from the state of Illinois for energy credits. The energy credits that the utilities got because of my solar, they reimbursed me $5,000. And that's one of the benefits of being a being a prosumer producer of electricity my electric bill was cut in half roughly in the summertime by the solar i can generate about three kilowatts three kilowatts is enough to supply a home almost <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, my home a yeah. modest home a modest yeah. home uh and you don't turn on the stove. Yeah. So one, but, one of our, our, our conference co-chair here just had a question. And she said, how do you choose a research topic? How do you balance theory and practice when you're doing research? Kind of in the dynamics and stability area. But in, you can talk about it in general. That's a great question and an important one. And I forgot to mention how important working with industry is. And Tom, you're the perfect example you spent time in industry and that gave you the background that you needed to communicate with other engineers and it has lasted you your entire career. I would say that the, one of the most important ways to, to uh, choose an area is to work with people in industry like PCIRC. PCIRC has industry members and they give money to do research it's an opportunity for the young faculty to communicate with them and talk to them and find out what they want. And if they want it, they will help you. And if they help you, you will get it published and you will get it funded. So working with industry is, is the, really the key. I personally have always chosen research areas that I like. I have been negligent in my own advice. I have not worked with industry as closely as I should. And therefore, um, that's bad. But that is the answer. And you should listen to Tom Overby because he knows better than most faculty members exactly the value of working with industry and even starting your own company. And Jess is telling me now that 
we need to wrap this up. So we very much appreciate you taking time to talk with us. And I'm sure you'd be welcome to people emailing you if they had additional questions. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in person very soon. So thanks, Pete. Hey, well, thank you so much for inviting me. It was really fun. And I am happy to answer any questions I get. I read my email 24 hours a day. So go ahead and uh, let me know and I'd be happy to talk to you. And thank you, Tom, for the gracious introduction and for the opportunity to do this.